True murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Gacy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, VTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. A former United Church minister massacres his family. What led to this act of femicide and why were his victims forgotten? On May 2, 1963, Robert Killens, a former United Church minister, slaughtered every woman in his family but one. She and her brother lived to tell the story of what motivated a talented man who had been widely admired, a scholar and graduate from Queen's University, to stalk and terrorize the women in his family for almost 20 years and then murder them. Through extensive oral histories, Cook and Carson painstakingly traced the causes of a, a femicide in which four women and two unborn babies were murdered over the course of one bloody evening. While they situate this murderous rampage in the literature on domestic abuse and mass murders, they also explore how the two traumatized child survivors found their way back to health and happiness. Told through vivid first-person accounts, this family memoir explores how a murderer was created. The book that we're featuring this evening is The Castleton Massacre, Survivors' Stories of the Killens Femicide, with my special guests, authors Sharon Ann Cook and Margaret Carson. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Sharon Ann Cook and Margaret Carson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations on this incredibly personal and important book. Let's first talk, Sharon, you write the prologue, how you became involved, how you learned about this incredible case and these murders, and then tell us about the genesis of this book together, the letters that were part of that. Tell us how this book evolved. Well, thanks very much um, for this, Dan. I should say, first of all, that in order to maintain voice in, in the book, I am the writer of the book, but there would have been no book at all had Margaret not been there every step of the way researching with me and gathering oral histories from herself and from her brother. So the genesis of this book came, I think, from from two sources. One is that Margaret and I were raised together from the time that she was 12 when she was orphaned by this massacre. She was raised uh, by my parents in our family. And we began talking about this terrible event in her life and in Brian's life, her brother, the first day that she was with our family, we shared a bedroom. And so we would often talk about this before going to sleep at night. And I think very early on, it occurred to both of us that uh, we should write this down. We should somehow get this into book form. But of course, this was a traumatic event. And it was many years, almost 60 years before we did that because of the depth of sadness, of trauma that uh, both children experienced. The second uh, source for it was my son, who is an historian and a writer. And he felt very strongly that this was something that we needed to do at this point before anybody else died in that most of the book was based on oral testimony, oral history from either those who are participated or those who were very close to the event. Through his urging and his wife's urging as well, we took this up as a kind of COVID project. Some of the work mm -hmm. was done prior to COVID, but a lot of it occurred during COVID as well. So that's where the, where the genesis came from, I would say. Peg, would you like to throw in on that? Mm -hmm. I, I think it is, the book is something that we have thought about for a long time. It took me though a while before I decided that I was all in. As you know, <laughs> I had to wait for my brother to be all in also. This is this was something that was so shrouded with uh, secrecy and silence that it wasn't until relatively recent years that we had the words to describe what happened. These words would be stalking, femicide, and 
I would say women's shelters. Suddenly, as these words developed in recent years, we had words to use to describe what happened to us. And I don't think we had the proper words as children. We knew what had happened, but we couldn't put it into any kind of perspective. We were still dealing with the grief for decades, for decades. You don't, you don't give that up. And yes, speaking about it over those years helped to clarify and put into place the pieces of the puzzle that added up to us somewhat understanding what happened within my family dynamics. And as you know, Dan, after reading this, it wasn't simply straightforward. It was complicated with many avenues. And it it took a lot of discussion to get there. And yes, does that help, Sharon? Yes, that's yeah. uh, that's very helpful, Peg, as always. I would second everything that you said there. And uh, I do want to underscore the centrality of Brian's involvement in mm-hmm. the process of research and in writing as well. Mm-hmm. Brian was a 10-year-old child when this occurred, and he was not as centrally placed in the family structure in terms of the lead up to the massacre as as you were, Margaret. I've said in the book that Margaret was really a linchpin. She was present and participated in every major event that occurred in the lead up to the uh, killings. And she therefore had a very important perspective, better, I think, than almost anyone else's. And she was trusted by both the perpetrator and by her mother. So that she was given a great deal of authority as a 12-year-old child to try to bring peace to a situation when Robert was beating up her sister, for example, when Robert was threatening her mother. She was involved in all of these. So I, I want to emphasize how important Margaret was, but I also it is important to remember how central to the period after both Margaret and Brian joined my family in 1963 how important Brian was in the process. Brian became a medical doctor. And so he has a very particular view of what happened from his adult perspective. He's now retired from that, but he is a very capable family doctor. And he looked at this from a perspective that neither Margaret nor I did. His oral histories are arresting and they're in the moment as well, which is a pretty extraordinary thing, 60 years afterwards, for a child to be able to remember as accurately as he did the emotional import of events and also what he was thinking. This was true both during the massacre itself and in the period following that. So I do, I want to underscore Brian's role and his support throughout this process. He has mm-hmm. not chosen to be uh, a co-author in it, but we could have done this project without, without Brian's involvement. Mm-hmm. Now, let's get to the murderer himself. He was born in 1907, Robert Ivan. And so tell us about his family life and his siblings. Do you want me to start with this one, Margaret? Do you want, okay. His early family life. His early family life. Yes. Yes. So he, Robert was born into a typical Ontario farm family for the period, a, a relatively poor family. He had two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother. And his younger brother was my father. So we need to say right from the start that I was related to Robert through my father, while Margaret was not related. She lived under his shadow for the first 12 years of her life, and very much so during the period of the massacre, a tremendous shadow that overcast the next few years of her life. But she wasn't related to him. Uh, He was not her father, as is often thought and was often reported in the newspapers of the time. So Robert, with his family, the family moved uh, west and homesteaded, as many families did in that period, to get free land, to work that land, and then to sell it for a profit. And that was exactly what his father did. His father continued doing that through the rest of his adult life, buying farms, improving the farms, selling them, very much as people do today in flipping houses. But in his case, it was improving the land. So Robert had a typical farm-based childhood. He was a talented child from the beginning, and he was really the star of the family. He was the child that his parents expected would change the world. And as a result... He came to think of himself as changing the world. 
uh, the mother definitely favored Robert over the other children. And we talk about this at considerable length because it helps to explain the shadow under which my own father, who was the youngest child in that family, lived as a, as a child. He, he couldn't compete with his older brother and he didn't try to compete. He admired him tremendously and loved him dearly. And it helps to explain one of the main reasons why I became involved in the project myself, which was to help to explain to myself why my father reacted as he did to his older brother's massacre and was never able really to blame him for what he did, this heinous act. The family prospered as homesteaders. It set them up for a solid middle-class life once they were back in Ontario. The older sister, Gladys, became a noted watercolorist as she was an art teacher, maybe the the worst teacher ever. She seems to have loathed children Mm -hmm. and, and the other teachers with whom she worked. Very frustrated woman, but a very talented woman. Robert was without any doubt as well, talented. He began university in 1924. He won scholarships at university. He almost, um, he also almost failed out in his first year. So he, he had some difficulty adapting. And the third child, my father, was also a talented student and also university educated, which is very unusual in the 1920s and 1930s. Margaret, do you want to add to that, his, his background, the family orientation? Well, when my mother married him, he was well into his 30s and she had just turned 18. So she was very young. And I'm sure this seemed quite romantic to her. She had a mind of her own and she loved life and she was a very happy person. Uh, So I think he was very attracted to her. At the time, I know that these, that she did not know what she was getting into, as is often the story, often the case, and, and spent a few years, I'm sure, sorting it out as he failed at being a minister for the United Church and eventually quit that before she left him with their first child, their only child, and that would be Pearl. And he decided, I think he decided to isolate her by moving her to homestead places, as was done when he was growing up. The the homestead idea of moving out west and finding land to develop. But he did isolate her at the time and cut her off from her family and friends. Again, that's a typical story, isn't it? To have power over someone to isolate them. So back to Robert would say that he became obsessed first with my mother and she tried to get away from him for years. I don't know where his obsession came from, but I I liken it to what Sharon just said, his ability to have a kind of charisma over people, his brother, his sister, people that he met, and my mother, but it became a really negative, malevolent kind of charisma after a while. And, And that kind of power, you know, I was thinking about this. I don't think that I have personally met another person, and I'm over 70, in my life that compares to him with that kind of malevolent power and charisma. Mm-hmm. Have mm-hmm. you, Sharon? I, I oh, don't know, but, but neither you nor I have consorted with other mass murderers, have we? So no, <laughs> I no. Think it, but I, I think you make a very important point in saying that there was something very attractive about this man. He was, uh, one of the things that we describe in the book are the ways in which he was similar to other mass murderers and the ways in which he was different. And I'm struck by his difference, given what you've just said there, Margaret, with regards to the fact that people were deeply impressed by him. Mm -hmm. He was a well-spoken man. He was a well-read man, as you would expect for somebody who had been to university. And he had this dark charisma that you you have described. He especially had that in the rural districts where he lived, where he chose to live. And the point you make about his isolating Florence, his young, very attractive young wife, is I think important to remember that he chose settings in which to live. First, as a United Church minister, he lived in four different uh, parishes, thrived in none of them, left in the middle of the night for most of them spend his time arguing with people, demanding more money in the, de- in the depths of the uh, Great Depression. Uh, so he lived there in rural settings, but then he chose rural settings also after he had left the ministry. 
The other thing that occurs to me from what you were just saying is that we can trace some of his characteristics that I think make him common with other mass murderers right from those early years in university. He appears to have suffered from depression um, for his entire adult life. We don't know why that was. We we don't know what the sources of that. I mean, he was never assessed. You you would never ask a United Church minister to be assessed for depression, but he clear he acted as if he had been depressed. Part of this were the enormous outsized expectations of this man that his mother and family had placed upon him and other people as well. But it had also to do with the fact that he made poor choices. And once he'd made one poor choice, he would make a whole series of other poor choices. And that, of course, resulted in a lot of frustration for him. He was a very frustrated person, and that feeds depression. So we know that 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 was a characteristic as well. The isolation that he exposed Florence to was characteristic for him as well. He was an isolated individual, and he was isolated, we think, consciously in order to not have authorities checking the kinds of things that he was doing, the the kinds of abuse that he was meeting out to, especially to Florence and to Pearl. And part of it also was was one of those self-fulfilling prophecies that when you become a kind of strange person, you are isolated. Not many people do want to interact with you. And it was quite clear to us that he frightened people in a very similar way to what we now are reading about the Nova Scotia murderer killing the 22 innocent people. This was a frightening man. And so was Robert, a frightening man. So a number Mm -hmm. of the characteristics were quite common and they were deeply rooted in his personal psyche, but also in the family dynamics. The one, one point I would just make in passing that I think makes the book unusual is that we do a deep dive into what that formative period in his life was like. This is rarely possible with mass murderers because most of those people have covered their tracks. They don't, you don't know what things were like for them. We do know. And we know that his early years, including his university years, were not years of privation. They were not years during which he had a good excuse for being depressed or for, you know, being angry with people, his developing anger. It was his personal psychology that caused him the misery that he imposed on others and that he lived through himself. This was not a man whose family background would explain why he became a mass murderer. You write that he treated Florence like a child when they first were married. He was much more educated and she was inexperienced. But as time went on, many years went on, Florence eventually gained assertiveness and confidence and, and also that that he was she was refusing and rejecting many of the things that that Robert had to say. Yes. Let's talk about Pearl and his relationship with Pearl. Yes, his relationship with Pearl was I would say it was so pressured. He wanted to exert his power and his influence over Pearl every minute of her life in everything that she did. He would sit down with her in the early years to help her do her homework, but she had to be perfect. And and as a younger child, often I would watch this. He was simply not interested in whatever I was doing because it made it more stark that I was watching him ask her to do her homework so that she made no mistakes. She could make no mistakes. So he was obsessed with Pearl. Looking back now as a mother, and I, I have children and grandchildren, I can't imagine what she was feeling throughout those years to have her father, who she loved and she wanted to impress and she wanted to make him happy, to have this pressure on her all the time. And we we see what happened. She couldn't leave fast enough when she became a teenager. We see what the result was of that when she could assert her own power and, and attempt to leave. I'm sure that with children, you never stop wanting to get the approval of a parent. But for her, uh, when she decided to date, her life just became a nightmare. It became a nightmare for her. And I can't explain his obsession with her because I think that he transferred his obsession about my mother to his daughter. And you asked the question, I think, before, or someone commented about him living outside our door. Remember that this was a very well-spoken man who could talk his way into anything if he wanted to. And I'm sure that he said, look, I'll just live nearby and I'll help 
raise Pearl. I'll help drive the kids to school. I'll help with things until until it wasn't help, and until it was violence. Did that help answer? Is that what you were looking for? Yes. Could I just break in here for a moment? And I just want to to say that maybe we should clarify uh, the family structures here just for a moment. Yes, yes. So Robert and Florence had one child, and that was Pearl. Florence managed to escape from Robert uh, when they lived in BC. She took the train across Canada. She ended up in Colburn, Ontario. And very soon after arriving there, she met the local lawyer, A.D. Hall, and they began living together. A.D. Hall was then Margaret and Brian and Patsy's father. So that's why I said at the beginning that Margaret is in no way related to Robert. She yes. was not his child. And one of the results was this of this was that Robert was seemingly quite comfortable with both Margaret and Brian. And probably eventually he would have been comfortable with Patsy too, had she been a little bit older. And that's one of the reasons that Margaret is such an important eyewitness for Almost everything that happened, everything significant that happened in the relationship uh, with Robert during the murders, et cetera, because she and Brian, who were kind of a tag team, Margaret leading the leading the the troop and Brian uh, uh, behind her and backing her up. The two of them were the great observers of this. They were children. They were involved in a number of the fracases. But Robert, at times, seemed not to care what they thought about things. Mm -hmm. He would take them on trips with him. They were kind of a buffer zone between himself and the world. And the result of that, as I say, is that you've got two now adults, senior citizens now, who saw virtually everything that was going on and who Mm -hmm. saw it more clearly, very likely, than the participants did. It was an odd kind of relationship, I'll, I'll just add, that I think he was both disinterested in how we would turn out, but we were used as pawns to keep his connection with my mother and my older sister. And he didn't, for the most part, he did mistreat us a little bit when he had us working, but he was a little bit more disinterested in whether we were academically successful. But I I really, looking back now and understanding as a grandmother, we were definitely used as pawns because the minute he had us close by, then he knew that our mother or our sister would also be close by. He would also ask us questions about what they were doing. So we were his inadvertent spies, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. You demonstrate or you you write about that to demonstrate this guy's, Robert's power, is that he would refuse to divorce Florence. And yet she had this relationship with A.D. Hall. The stalking and the intimidation and the threat of violence was so bad that they moved to a law office for two years, you say, and lived in cramped quarters just to get away so that this guy couldn't build a shack nearby and stalk and intrude on their lives. Just to demonstrate how serious this guy's stalking and intimidation was. And Sharon, you you had mentioned to me what it took to have a divorce. Yes, it it was extremely difficult. It was expensive. It, it took act of parliament to have a divorce. That's right. So it this was not likely going to occur. I think so, so that Florence was held within his grip to a degree. And as years wore on, I think it's important to remember that. Florence was without financial resources, partly because he would not give her that divorce. He was on welfare and he gave her little bits of money here and there. And this is after A.D. Hall had died. So Margaret's father, A.D. Hall, was quite a bit older and he died of a heart attack, serious heart uh, disease in 1962, the year prior to the, uh, the massacre. And uh, when we talk about those factors that made the massacre, not a certainty, but certainly pushed the record forward, A.D. Hall's death was a very important marker, not just because it meant that Florence was now destitute and she had to go back to Robert in order to have food for her three still dependent children, but also the, the factor of A.D. Hall having been a great peacemaker. He was a remarkable man. And I think if anything helped to hold off the massacre for those 
almost 20 years, yes, 20 years, it was A.D. Hall's Mm -hmm. negotiating with him. And one of the points of negotiation, of course, was Robert's insistence that he would build a shack close to the family so that he could maintain his relationship with Pearl. Yeah. What about Robert's health? How much of an influence and a factor was that? And what was his health specifically like at that time or in those declining years before this massacre? I'll just mention, and then you can add to this, that he hated doctors. They were evil. Uh, They were ignorant. He called them quacks. He hated doctors. So he refused to go, even though I think for a number of years, he knew that he was ill, going down that road of probably a diabetic condition. But he refused to go until he was literally carried out on a stretcher and unconscious. He refused to see a doctor. And that was, I remember my mother and AD wanting him to see a doctor when he became ill. I'm sure that they understood how serious it was, but until he was carried out unconscious, he refused to get help. And Sharon, I'll let you take over what. Sure. Well, I'm just, I'm glad you mentioned that because it reminds us that another one of Robert's characteristics, which put him in good company with those who carry out massacres, is that he was anti-authoritarian. Mm. He he did not believe that doctors' training gave them any special knowledge about him or his body, and uh, so his first and he was that way generally with people who were traditional yeah. authorities in the society. That I think doesn't take too much to realize that he himself had lost his position of authority. And so he was prepared to level every other person who presented themselves as an authority. So he was a diabetic. He was a serious diabetic. He had come by it genetically. His own mother had been a diabetic and had died of diabetes. In the end, Robert partly died from diabetes. It was certainly a contributing factor. He refused uh, because of his relationship with doctors that Margaret's just uh, surveyed. He refused to regularly take insulin. And uh, the result was a body that was just wrapped, I'm sure with pain, but certainly difficulties with his extremities, as is very common with diabetes. He got to the stage where he could not wear shoes. He could only wear slippers that were inside galoshes. And uh, the galoshes had buckles on them that jingled as he walked. So this was somebody who was kind of musical as he walked around. He uh, developed carbuncles, uh, terrible boils on his body that uh, he would force his estranged wife to dress. And he fell into a coma, Mm -hmm. two junctures, I believe, right, Margaret? Mm -hmm. And was, was hospitalized. He was expected to die, and he did not. While he was in hospital, his estranged wife's parents were visiting, trying to help with the children, and they burned his shack to the ground, which further enraged him. And as one would imagine would happen. Mm-hmm. The, the result of that was kind of permanent rage that he was in. It was, it was beyond anger at that point for about the last year of his life. And that was the year during which the family was destitute because A.D. Hall had died, was not in a position to leave anything to Florence because of the lack of their having not been married, and where the family came closer and closer into Robert's orbit. Mm -hmm. Let's use this as an opportunity, Sharon and Margaret, to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor, which is ZipRecruiter. I'm excited to travel this summer. Have you ever thought about all the people that make a vacation truly great, like the hotel concierge who knows the best places to go, or the tour guide with great stories? and other great suggestions to go while you're on vacation. You know, outstanding talent is crucial for a successful business. And if you're hiring, you can find talent for roles like these and more at ZipRecruiter. When you try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. Additionally, ZipRecruiter has a complete suite of tools that makes it easy to filter, review, and rate your candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. So, travel to this easy-to-remember web destination, ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. That's where you can try ZipRecruiter for free 
Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, Sharon and Margaret, this, we were talking about the last year leading up to this massacre in 1963 in May. What happens with this living conditions of Florence? She's dependent on Robert, but uh, tell us about further developments in her relationship and what happens in the ensuing year to ramp up the tensions, at least in Robert's mind? During that last year after A.D. died, in the middle of the night, we moved back into the house that A.D. had started to build for us. It was mostly completed. And we moved back to Castleton from the law office because, of course, we were no longer allowed to stay in the law office with A.D. gone. And just before just before that time, uh, my older sister, my mother took her out west. This was after she'd been beaten up by Robert to get her away from him. But she had a boyfriend and, you know, she had a mind of her own. So she came back on her own and eloped and and rebelled. This was her form of rebellion. And she became pregnant during that time. Soon after that, uh, we didn't see her for a while because she lived with her husband away from us. And during that time, some months later, my mother did meet someone who promised to protect us, decided to move in to protect us during not he wasn't with us very long, but she'd been seeing him for a little while. And she became pregnant with his child. And my sister was pregnant. I think these two facts made some kind of impact on Robert where he was over the top with anger. I remember very loud fights where my mother would just be asking him. He didn't come into our house on a regular basis. He would come in when we were there, I believe, to look around, but not while we were there. And they were fighting. She asked him to leave her alone many times. And I think that when he lost control of her life, and when he lost control of Pearl's life and she moved, she and her husband moved close by because he offered them, he offered them a house. He offered them, I think he may have offered a car if they moved close. And I'm sure that he was very persuasive and they did move close. So that put him right in the middle of the two houses, Pearl on one side, our family on the other. And that led up to May 2nd, 1963 during those last few weeks of 1963. And the last part of that puzzle, my aunt Gladys Killens lived up north near Orangeville, if I have that right. And she and my mother were writing letters back and forth. She came, she came to talk to my mother. And so she was in, a, in, in one of the empty cabins that was on the property for probably only one day. Wow. Uh, came on May 1st. And then the tragedy happened on May 2nd. That Does that help explain yeah, the, uh, what led up to it? Yeah. Can I just throw in there an, yeah. another couple of factors? So as Margaret says, Florence began a new relationship with a very fine man who, when push came to shove during the massacre, was amongst the most heroic of the people who stepped forward to try to protect the family. She, Florence and Tom Major his name, had decided they were going to move to Sudbury. And that move, we think, was a precipitating factor as well in convincing Robert that the time had come when he had to end all of this. There was one other factor, too, that we have found fascinating as we've tracked this. At the inquest, after Robert's death and the deaths of the family as well, one, the medical examiner found that Robert had a considerable amount of poison in his system, strychnine in particular. Strychnine had been used traditionally by athletes when they were attempting to better their time. It, it goes back to the time of ancient Greece. And Robert had read about this and knew that, or knew, had the notion that small amounts of poison would give him added energy. So he was taking small amounts, which eventually collected in the system, and they were it was a considerable amount that was found after death. And this 
might very well have fired his anger even further. Um, it operates something like a steroid uh, before it kills you. Mm. And he continued to do this. And during the actual massacre, during which he showed a superhuman ability to keep on going, even after his part of his skull was caved in by a, with, with a hammer that Tom Major wielded to try to protect the family, he was still able to keep going. And some of that, we are speculating, was due to the fact that he had taken poison. And while on the one hand, it gave him energy, on the other hand, it fired his fury beyond where it already stood. So there were a number of factors that were short term that, and I think the most important of those was his recognition that he was about to lose Florence to a physical move. And also the three children, she was going to take, of course, her children, but he was also about to lose Pearl uh, and it already lost her to a degree because she was about ready to give birth to her baby. She was going to be a new mother and he would be increasingly out of the picture. Margaret, let's talk about the massacre itself. The, you, you go from the timeline of three in the afternoon to 947, 948. As uncomfortable as it is, can, as you do in the book, can you take us through that horrible day? Well, yes. I mean, my brother and I have often spoken about this because it's, I won't go over every hour, but it's, it's so clear in our minds. And we realized in writing this book that that timeline was only clear in our minds and no one else's. And and as we sat down with Sharon, I think it took a few sit downs, right, Sharon, to get this timeline straight. The afternoon did start with, with me um, taking letters between Gladys and my mother. I mean, who knows what were in the letters? I, we never saw them. No one ever found them. If they found them, they burnt them. I'm not sure what happened to them. And I'm sure they were speaking about Robert's behavior his erratic behavior and and the fear of him and what he was going to do. As in the book, it shows that there were four houses on the property and it was quite a large piece of property. So I was running from one house to the other. I would visit my older sister in one house and help her with the dishes and have supper. Then I'd come back to my house, maybe grab a letter, take it to Gladys, who was in a different house. So you have to think that these were houses based on, I don't know what, maybe a an acre of land. And that particular evening when I went back, I didn't know when I went into my bedroom after saying goodnight that the sound I heard was a gunshot. I don't think I realized that. I, I hear people who speak of this now. I thought something dropped. I thought something very heavy had dropped, so I wasn't sure. So, But I did hear my mother scream, so I knew it wasn't good. And when I ran out, it was obvious to me that my mother had been shot. Even at the time, I saw the guns and uh, ran to my sisters for help. That was my first instinct was to run and get help to my sister and her husband. And um, I wasn't there too long. She comforted me and took me into the bedroom where we sat for a long time until we heard speaking. And I recognized Robert's voice and knew he had come to that house. There was a bit of a blur in the next I don't know how long, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, and a, an awful lot of, of gunshots. And as it says in the book, I got myself under the bed, and who knows how long I was under there. And I'll just mention one thing. At a certain point during that time, Robert fell within a foot of my face, right his on. face and my face, and his yeah. eyes were open and he was looking straight ahead. But he did not see me. Wow. He had tripped or he'd fallen. What I did see was the gun and his face. I don't think he registered that he was looking at anyone underneath that bed. I don't remember much after that for quite a while. And as Sharon says in the book, perhaps I'd passed out. I don't know if that word was in my terminology at 12 years old, but I survived. Good. Do you want me to keep going? I, th I think that's enough to put you through, Peg. Okay, Sharon, can you continue with this rampage and its result? Well, I will say this fairly briefly. This, I think this needs to be read in order to understand, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. It moves very quickly. Uh, it involves not only Peg, who has a very dramatic experience being trapped under that bed and facing Robert, but it involves also Tom Major, whom I mentioned earlier, who had wrestled with Robert in order to get the 
two handguns out of his hands and in the process of doing so fired the handguns at him and neither worked. They had worked once to kill Florence and to shoot Tom Major, but they didn't work a second time. Incredible. And the, the result was that Tom Major used the only weapon he had at hand, which is a hammer. And it was, though, or was those hammer blows to Robert's head that eventually killed him. But it took until the next day. In the process, Brian was shot very close range by a shotgun and thought he had been killed. There, there is a very moving account in in the book from Brian as to what that feels like to be fired at short range as a child. And, and I will let him speak for that. Pearl was murdered and left in a closet. Peg did not know this at the time. Various other people ran for their lives. They didn't attempt to help. Where, as I say, Tom Major is one of the heroes of this story. The second hero was Brian's teacher, Peter Miller, who uh, lives in Toronto now, has had a very successful life after his one his first year of teaching. This is his first year of teaching in a little country school. And oh. uh, he came running to try to help as well. And he was the most seriously wounded of any. It took him a year to recover from his wounds. He went back to teach uh, one more year, got a university degree, and then carried on with publishing. And as I say, has had a, had a, a good life. So there is uh, a heroism. In this story, there is cowardice in the story, and there is a lot of blood. And the result of that was, of course, to traumatize these two children to the point where they needed to spend a good deal of time as they were growing into teenagers once they joined my family in Calgary. And so the last third of the book addresses how they emerged from the fog, which is a characteristic of trauma, the, the sort of trauma they had experienced, into living a relatively normal life, happy life, and in the end, very productive lives. They both raised wonderful families and both have a bevy of grandchildren now. I think Peg is ahead of the game here in the grandchildren territory, but oh, uh, no, are sure. you? <laughs> I don't Maybe know. You're I not. Have seven, you're not. seven grandchildren, I yes. think. I think Brian might have seven grandchildren oh, also. Okay, I, I thought he was at six. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, never one to be bested by our younger brother. In any in any event, they both had happy, productive lives and have been very productive members of society. And so that period of trauma, which we investigate quite closely in the period after they came to live in Calgary, was one that was extraordinarily painful for both of them. Painful for my parents as well, who were doing what they could to help the situation. I had run away by that point to university in Edmonton. And so it, one of the other things that we look at is that the, the result was a reconstituted family. It became a second family to my parents with the two children and uh, these two quite senior people at that point. They were, what were they paying? They're well into their 50s. My father oh, was yeah. looking at retirement. And so it, it put that off a bit, but they ended up having a very warm relationship. And my parents lived to be old and they were, they were just terribly proud of both Margaret and Brian as they came to visit them often and helped. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these messages. Now, you talk about how important the survivor stories are. And for people that are reading, want to know how on earth you could recover from something like this. And especially when you write about there was no diagnosis of PTSD, no understanding of any kind of recovery strategies, any kind of techniques to be able to help these people. But uh, you also talk about very interesting that decision was that your father, Sharon, and, and mother decided to take Brian and Margaret into their home and then were able to have an environment in which Margaret and Brian were able to heal. Uh, tell us about the this healing situation, this family unit reconstructed. I think, I mean, every child is different. So the story is going to be different for any child of such a tragedy. Brian and I, if I were to boil down to two words, it would be time and space. We were given the time and space to heal, but we also had, I think within us, the foundation of people who saw 
our strengths. And it doesn't take many people in a child's life for a role model to say, you are strong enough to do this. So I think any child that has at least one person to say, to see in them their own strengths to carry on, because for us, the foundation was my mother and AD loved us very much. And they gave us that foundation. I know my mother was a strong person. I knew AD was a kind, calm, wonderful man. I had that foundation. You can't take that away through this kind of trap. You can't take that foundation away. That wasn't stripped from us. What was taken from us was we were silenced for a long time. And writing this book, and so was so were the women silenced. But writing this book has, I would say, given us back some kind of voice and control, even more so than we had in the last number of years. It's returning the control to us that was taken. And perhaps that's what femicide is, is to silence women and whoever stands in your way and and to gain control. And maybe that was inborn in us, that we had that kind of strength to begin with, to overcome this for the sake of the people that we lost. We wanted them to be proud of us. We wanted those, my mother, my sisters, we wanted them to be proud of us. And even though we didn't verbalize that, I think that was always inside us that we have to represent them. We have to succeed and we have to win. So I um, think that is absolutely uh, right, Margaret, in the way in which you've you've, uh, phrased that. Yeah, I think it's really important in this story of overcoming trauma to recognize that these were not maimed children when they when they joined my family in Calgary. They were, they were strong, sturdy, much loved children. And my parents recognized that, that they had tremendous capacity, both of them very bright, able to deal with a, a huge cultural change as well as a personal domestic change in coming to Calgary. So th- this makes this situation different. As you say, Margaret, every situation is different. But I think the classification is important for me, that children who have been abused for their lives who would experience something like this are going to react very differently from the way that you and Brian reacted, not having been abused. You had periods of fright of living close to Robert when he would engage you in one of his crazy schemes and use you as forced labor, etc. But that's different, as you point out, from being an abused child. You weren't an abused child. You were part of a very loving family. So Mm -hmm. it provided you both with a, a strong basis and as you say, confidence that you could you could move forward. From my parents' point of view, you know, they they had no training in something like this. My 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 mother was a nurse, but she'd never dealt with anything of this magnitude. My father was an animal nutritionist. What did he know about any of this? The two of them kind of flailing around, but moving forward and with a strong sense that there was a terrible wrong that had to be righted. And the only way it could be righted was by giving these children a chance, a new chance at a life. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, we had each other, Brian and I were two survivors, not one, two survivors. I think that that definitely helped us also. And, And also, Sharon, when I moved there, having you there just as a sister to talk to, that helped me. Brian, it was it was far more difficult. And I understand that fully. And uh, took a little bit longer, but we're still very close, the two of us. We share this background that probably only we understand, even though most of it's in the book. There's so much that we understand of each other that we don't need to even say aloud. Mm -hmm. What's very, very interesting, especially when you talk about comparing, when people wonder how someone can turn out so bad and other people in the family turn out so good. You talk about Harold's, your father, Sharon's demeanor, his, his, his behavior, his mentality was so much different than Robert, but also Gladys engaged in some of the same kinds of behavior, had the same kind of temperament as Robert. They argued very and screamed at each other, and she didn't get along with very many people 
outside of her family as well. But Harold presented a completely different philosophy through his whole life in comparison, not cynical, optimistic. And that, you, you write, was even though he looked very much like Robert, which was must have been very uh, eerie, that it was much it was presented as a much different family life than you had ever grown up with, with the presence of Robert nearby. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think um, one of the things that this writing this book uh, reminded me about, I guess we've all seen this over the course of our lives. But what I was reminded of was how very differently siblings can turn out within the same family structure. Right. And as you point out, and so just taking my father and Robert and Gladys as a case in point, and I've often thought that there's a real advantage to being considered the weak link in a given family unit, as Harold was. My father was the last born child. He was a slow poke as a little guy. He didn't impress his mother and maybe his father. I don't know. It's, it, the relationship seems to have been warmer with his father, but he certainly did not impress his mother as having any ability of any sort. And in fact, he was more successful at university than Robert mm-hmm. was. But what it left him with was a strong sense of humility that, no, maybe he wasn't hot stuff. And he was going to have to work very hard and get along with people in order to be successful in life. And that made the difference. That seems to have made the difference. The other two seem to have been very, correct me if I'm wrong in this, Peg, but a haughty, haughty in the sense that they had both, they both had a strong sense of their own superiority. And I think Harold had no sense of his own superiority at all. He thought of himself as Mr. Inferiority. And, right. and the result was that, that he, would, he spent his life bucking up everybody else. So as a child, yeah. my childhood and my brother's childhood, and then when Peggy, when Margaret and Brian came to join the family, all of us were, he spent time telling us how terrific we were. Not how terrific he was, how terrific we were. That's right. And he told us that too, how terrific we were all the time, Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. which was, like I said, time and space. They yeah. gave us time and space. They didn't let the other shoe drop. We were always waiting for the other shoe to drop and there to be some kind of violence or anger or arguments. It never happened ever <laughs> in the house in Calgary. No. Now with this book, what has this, I mean, it's, just going to be released. It's just been released. Tell us what this book and the writing of it has done for you. Well, just mention this, that for me, it has given me back my voice to be able to talk about something to my children and my grandchildren. I just had a conversation with my son yesterday who said, I just finished the book. He said, It explains so much. He said, I don't know how you could have told me all that in (sighs) sitting down in a conversation. He was so grateful. And that's the ultimate for me compliment and reward for sitting with Sharon, telling her all of this information going through this is that one of my kids said to me, thank you for putting this into perspective. I, I kind of know who you are now. And I thought, that's amazing. That that's amazing. But I also feel like I'm giving back the voice to my mother, my sisters, my aunt, who completely disappeared out of existence. And the comments in the last year or two or three is that, gosh, I never heard about this tragedy. I didn't hear about this femicide. I didn't know that happened. We've heard that over and over again, meaning those people have been lost. And if you looked it up online, you'd see Robert Killens, the perpetrator, but you wouldn't would not read much about my mother and my sisters and my aunt and to bring them back to understand them. And I've spoken to people who've known them, especially my older sister was has been that has been a reward in and of itself also to have someone say to me, gosh, I went to high school with your sister and this is what she was like. And that's also a reward for me. Sharon, I'll let you add to that well i i want to support everything you you've said like you uh part of the effect of writing this book has been personal uh, in my case it was to know more about these four women who were murdered unjustly but it was also to understand my own father better i will admit that i was angry with my father's inability 
to acknowledge his brother's heinous crime. Right. I understand now much better why that was so. And I am, am grateful for that. But like you, I also have a broader societal result of having written this. And it is to have made it clearer to me the scourge that femicides still represent in our society. Yes. We we think we've made tremendous progress. We've we've made some progress for sure, but we are a long way from addressing this reasonably as a society. As the Renfrew County inquest just completed mm-hmm. what 10 days ago. Yeah. Shows that women who find themselves in this position, especially women in rural districts, are on their own. They're on their own and they live in terror. That is, is something we've, we've got to correct. And the uh, 16 recommendations of that inquest, I think, are, are well worth looking at. They, they're, they're well considered, well considered. And they're, we have a, a responsibility as a society to do something about the situation before it becomes another case of femicide where women are, are murdered. I guess I would, I would mention also that in the press recently, we've seen fair analysis about the Nova Scotia shooter. And I mentioned this earlier, the woman who was at the, the abused woman who was at the heart of that instance held off a violent, malicious man for 19 years. Margaret's mother Florence held off a malicious, violent man for 16 years. Yes. I have to say, I find that amazing. That's just amazing. We think of these women as being victims. What they were was resilient and smart. Somehow, they're able to get through a situation with somebody who has got a hair trigger temper and who is quite happy to murder people. And they they keep the show going for years and years. I think that's astonishing. And that is one thing that that became clear to me in writing this. Just what an achievement that was on the part of those women and what an achievement it still is on the part of many other women who face violence all the time in the domestic sphere. And not all of these women are murdered. They're living this life right now. They're holding off these people. They may not get murdered, but think of how many women are doing this as we speak, holding these men off. It's shocking that it's still occurs, obviously, but it is really, this book really shows the societal norms at that time were shocking. To go back that many years, it's, it seems like a history that, that I had no idea of, even though I'm 63 years of age. So I want to thank you both, Margaret Carson and Sharon Ann Cook, for talking about the Castleton Massacre, Survivor's Stories of the Killens Femicide. It's been a fascinating interview. Can you tell our audience where this book was published and when it is officially going to be released. Tell us a little bit more about people might find out about this book. Published by Dunder and Press out of Toronto. It is available everywhere now in independent bookshops, at chapters. One, for some reason or other, the printing was done earlier than we expected. And it's been available since about the middle of June. (laughs) So we are delighted to say that one can find this book at any bookseller. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The Castleton Massacre, Survivor's Stories of the Killens Femicide, Sharon Ann Cook and Margaret Carson. Thank you so much for this interview. Congratulations on the book and good night. Thank you.